morning, First Assembly. Welcome to First at Home. We're excited and thankful that you've joined us for worship this morning, and we hope that you are doing well and staying safe and healthy in your homes. We're going to sing a new song this morning called The Blessing. It is a declaration of blessings over your family, over your children, and your, the future generations. And um, so we're just going to sing this over our homes right now. Wherever you are in your home, spread out throughout the city, um, we're joining together in one song so that we can praise the Lord. So I'm going to share a scripture. This is Isaiah 40, verse 28. It says, Have you never heard or understood? Don't you know that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth? He never grows faint or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to those who are tired and worn out. He offers strength to the weak. Even youth will become exhausted and young men will give up. But those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. They will fly high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So we choose this morning to worship the Lord, to follow Him, and to be blessed by Him. And we want to just pour out our worship to Him this morning. So I invite you to welcome the presence of the Lord into your home and into your hearts. Set aside whatever distractions may be around you and just prepare your heart to worship Him. Could you sing with us this morning? Lord bless you.
thank you so much for making a way when life seems impossible. God, there is nothing impossible with you. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, God. Thank you for your goodness and your blessings, Lord Jesus. We claim your blessings over our families, Father, and our children. Hey church family, welcome to our online streaming of Church at Home. We pray that God will bless you as you watch today. Thank you for tuning in. Hello, thank you for joining us today. You know, I have grown up in the church. As a young boy, I went to Sunday school classes and I would listen to my teacher tell stories of Moses and the Red Sea and dividing the sea and I'd take home quarterly and uh, read about it or coloring and I'd color it and and I grew up in Sunday school hearing about the stories of the Bible. I valued that. It helped a lot shape who I am, I suppose. I still remember my Sunday school teachers, many of them, for years now gone by, and I still remember them. Then I became a teenager and I started going to youth group. Listen to my youth pastor speak and talk about the things of the Lord. And I remember one night, 13 years of age, in February 1973, when God spoke to my heart and uh, Wednesday night service. After service, I went up to my youth pastor, Dan, and I said, Dan, I'd like to talk to you for just a few moments. Just you and I. He said, okay. Took me to a side room, and before I walked through the door of the room, I was in tears. As I was needing to repent and ask Jesus to come into my heart. I'm so thankful for that youth pastor. As I continued growing in the church, listening to sermons, and, and being involved in the church, I ultimately became a pastor. Served as a leader, and then became a missionary, visited churches, and, and shared vision and heart, and, and churches stood with us, and we planted churches overseas and started a Bible college. And always valued the church. Today, I serve as the lead pastor of First Assembly here in Walla Walla. Love our church. Love just the opportunity to serve here. And, and here's the thing. I stand here today because of hundreds, if not thousands, of Christians, believers, who invested in the churches that I attended as a child, as a young person, even as an adult. And people gave their tithes to those churches that touched my heart. And today I stand here as an answer to their prayers as they gave and they prayed. I'm here because of them. I stand on their shoulders. Today, you and I have an opportunity to be the ones that give in our tithe and our offering. Because there's a whole generation of young children and youth that are coming up behind us. And they need to stand on our shoulders because of our faithfulness to God. And one day, who knows? one of those kids or one of those young people are going to be the lead pastor of this church preaching to the next generation and they will stand there because of men and women like you and like me that trust God enough to say I will give you my tithe and my offering so this morning I'm going to ask you to be faithful in your giving to God you can go to our website and find the giving app and log on and give a tithe and offering that way. It's very convenient, it's safe, it's secure. Or you can send a check in the mail to 1919 Fern Avenue, Walla Walla, Washington, 99362. You can even drop it by our church office Monday through Friday in the morning hours. Either way, I want to say thank you because I believe by faith there are going to be young people and children standing on your shoulders in the years ahead in the faith because today you chose to give. Hi kids, get ready for Kids Church in three, two, one. What does Jesus say about worry? 
Today your lesson comes from Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 34. Hi boys and girls, it's Pastor Rebecca and welcome to Kids Church. Today in Kids Church, we're going to learn all about worry. Do you worry? And what do you worry about? But most importantly, what does Jesus say about worry? Well first, let's look at the word of the day. The word of the day is worry. It's a verb and it means allowing your mind to think on difficulty or troubles. So boys and girls, now that we know what the word worry means, it means when we allow our minds to think about troubles or difficulty, it's time to see if you're a worry wart. Are you ready to take our worry wart quiz? Say that three times fast. Worry wart quiz, worry wart quiz, worry wart quiz. Well, you get it, worry wart quiz. Okay, so I'm gonna go slow so that you can think about each question as I ask, and then I'm gonna ask you to participate with me and count the number of yes answers you have. Are you ready? Let's take the worry wart quiz. Follow along and give yourself one point for each yes answer. Do you allow your mind to worry about snakes and spiders? Storms or natural disasters like earthquakes? Being alone? Worrying that the teacher may be angry with you? Scary news or TV shows? Sickness or injury? Failing? Not having enough food or clothes? Or do you worry about having bad dreams? Okay, boys and girls, so now it's time to play the worry work quiz. Are you ready? So I want you to get your fingers out or your hands out and I want you to hold them like this. And every time I say something that you worry about, you're gonna put your finger up like this. Now there's nine in all. Right? And so if you're afraid or you worry about all of them, at the end, your fingers are gonna look like this. And if you're not worried at all, then they're gonna look like this. Okay, are you ready to play the game? It's called the Worry Work Quiz. Worry Work Quiz, Worry Work Quiz, ready? All right, are you worried about snakes or spiders? Do you think about that often? Snakes and spiders and crawly things, creepy crawly things? So if your answer is yes, then you're going to put your finger up just like that, okay? Are you, do you worry about storms or natural disasters like earthquakes, um, tsunamis, or just really bad rainstorms with lots of thunder and lightning? So if you worry about that, you put your fingers up just like that, okay? All right, here's the next one. Do you worry about being alone? If that's one of your worries, you just put your fingers up. How about a teacher being angry with you or upset with you? Do you worry about that? Do you worry about your teachers being upset with you or angry? If so, then you just put your finger up. How about scary news on the TV or TV shows that might have scary content? Do you worry about that? If so, put your finger up. How about being injured or having a sickness? Do you worry about having sick, getting sick or your family getting sick or getting hurt? If so, put your finger up. All right, the next one is, do you worry about failing? Maybe trying your hardest and then having it fail or it not turning out the way you want? Well, if that's one of your worries, put your finger up. Okay, having, worrying about not having enough. Maybe you're worrying about not having enough food or not having enough clothes. Do you worry about that? If so, put your finger up. And the very last one is, do you worry about having bad dreams at night? Does it help? Does it uh, take you a long time to get to sleep in your bed because maybe you're, you are worrying that you might have a bad dream? Well, if that's you, put your finger up. If you said yes to any one of these common worries for kids your age, well, congratulations, because that means you're human. And what do humans need more than anything else? Jesus! The good news for us worriers, boys and girls, is that the Bible is filled with reminders that teach us to do the opposite of worry. And that reminds me of the verse of the week. The verse of the week comes from 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your worry on him because he cares for you. I'll read it again. Cast all your worry on him because he cares for you. Now, boys and girls, let's make it personal. Let's read it like this. I will cast all my worry on you, God, because you care for me. Let's say it again. 
I will cast all my worry on you, God, because you care for me. Today our lesson comes from Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 34, and it's about Jesus talking to his disciples. Now his disciples, remember, were humans just like we are, and I have a sneaky suspicion that they were worriers too. Let's find out, let's read together and find out what Jesus tells the disciples about worry. I'm gonna start at verse 22 and you can follow along. It says this, oh, let me put on my glasses to read the good book, let's see, oops. Well, we'll just put it right there. <laughs> then Jesus spoke to his disciples and he said, I tell you, do not worry. Don't worry about your life and what you will eat and don't worry about your body and what you will wear. There is more to life than eating and there is more important things for the body than clothes. Think about the ravens or the birds. They don't plant or gather crops. They don't have any storerooms at all, but God feeds them and you are worth much more than the birds. Can you even add one hour to your life by worrying? You can't do that very little thing, so why worry about the rest? So did you hear that, boys and girls? Did you hear what Jesus was telling his disciples about worry? He tells them, don't worry. And he goes on to remind the disciples how good of care he takes care of even the birds. And in fact, he goes on to say uh, later on in the story that he takes care of the flowers too. And how much more valuable are you and me, humans, right, the very best of his creation? How much more will he take care of us? He says, don't worry, because it doesn't do any good to worry about the things we have no control over. But guess who has control over them? Jesus. Jesus knows exactly what you need, boys and girls, and he knows exactly how to get you the things that you need. Are we going to trust him? Because that's a key here, is to trust Jesus with our worries. We can give it to him knowing that he has every power. Let's turn our worry into trust. So now that we know that Jesus says, don't worry, well, how do we do that? You might say, I worry all the time. It's my habit. That's where my mind goes to is troubles and difficulties. But how do I stop doing that? Well, guess what? In the Bible, in this story, there's this verse in 31, and I'm going to read it to you, and it tells us the key to doing things differently in our minds. I'm going to read it to you. Verse 31 says, but put God's kingdom first then those other things will also be given to you. What's it saying is that we need to go to God's word first, not our worry. Because see, sometimes we have trained our brains to worry first and then trust God second. But Jesus wants us to flip that and reverse it. He wants us to trust him first and not worry about the rest because we have every confidence that Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. We trust him, right? So we can give him our worries and we can trade them in for all of God's promises. But now I think I wanna show you something that I, want, I think might help you to really begin to practice thinking about God's word first before your worries. Come with me and I'll show you. Okay, boys and girls, I wanna show you what I've done today that I think is really gonna help you to refocus your mind. See, sometimes we get in the habit of worrying instead of trusting God. And so that, remember that verse, verse 31, that tells us to seek God's kingdom first. So it says that we need to be thinking about God's word first instead of our worry. And so I want to show you a way that you can do this at home uh, to turn your worry into trust. Are you ready? Okay, so here's what I've done is I just took my big chalkboard. And maybe you have one at home, or maybe you can just do this on a piece of paper. But what I've done is I've labeled it God's promises. And what I did is I just began to think in my mind of all the things I know to be true about God. See, he is my provider. And it says, the Bible says that he will comfort me. And if I call on him, he will always answer me. It says he is my defender. He is my peace. He will hold me with his hand. That's what the Bible says. Well, I wrote down all of these good quality traits that God has, and I wrote them down for me to look at and to be reminded about. And then what I did is I began to write down all the list of my worries. Now, remember that quiz that we took earlier today? Well, you might have said yes to every single one of those, right? That's nine worries that are constantly going through your head. But what I found is that when I looked at those list of worries, they're common worries that boys and girls your age have, and then I put it up against God's promises, I found that the list of God's promises are way longer than the list of worries that you probably have. You see, we can never 
match God. His goodness is always going to win. His, his promises are always going to be bigger than our fears and our worries. We can never outmatch him. And so I want to show you this today. This is so cool. So that very first one, snakes and spiders. Well, there's a bunch of promises right here, but which one could we say is true if I have worries about snakes and spiders? Well, look right here. It says, he keeps me safe. The Bible says that he is our refuge. It says in Psalms that he is a rock that we can hide under, right? The cleft. It says he is, he will keep me safe. Well, it's not amazing that I can be afraid of creepy crawly things, but the Bible says that I don't need to be because God will keep me safe. How about this? Um, being alone. What if you fear that you're being alone? Well, here it is. I will never leave you. Right here. Where does it say that? Um, I am, if I call on him, he will always answer. It says he will abide in me. It says that he will never leave me. Look at three promises in one worry. See, God always outmatches us, doesn't he? Let's talk about this one. How about not having enough? Maybe you worry that you don't have enough food, especially right now where the grocery stores sometimes run out of food, right? Uh, but guess what, guess what it says here? It says that God is my provider right here. It says that he is my provider. We don't have to worry about not having enough because in our story today, it talks about how God even takes care of the birds, takes care of the flowers. How much more will he take care of me? He is my provider. See, if we did this every time we worry, instead of worrying, 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 being a worry wart, instead we turn to God's word and we begin to list all of the ways that he has promised us that he would be with us they will always be a bigger list here, boys and girls, than there is of our worries. Will you do that with me this week? Will you make a list of all your worries and then a list of all of God's promises? And I promise that you will find that God's promises way outweigh your list. You know what? I love you so much and so does Jesus. And I just hope that you continue to trust Jesus instead of worrying. Will you join me next week? I love you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hi, I have journeyed all around the world. Overseas in Europe, when I travel from place to place, the planes are really small. In fact, some of my Russian planes I've gone on, it feels like you should be helping pedal because they're so small. Well, as a result of that, even suitcases like this weren't allowed. You'd have to pay extra for them, and they charge quite a bit. And so I traveled to places for maybe two weeks to teach, and this would be everything I would bring for the whole two weeks. And it's not much there. And so we really started thinking, how do we go on this journey and have what we need to do it right and, and to be able to have what I need to have on that journey? And, and we discovered these vests that were pretty cool. And the vests had pockets in them. Now, I'm wearing one of my vests. It has 42 pockets in it. And it allows me to have everything I need for this journey. Now, I just want to take a moment and unfold some of the things that are in my vest. If I open up my little pocket over here, let me see. Oh yeah, yeah, my Greek lexicon. That's really important to have your teaching. And, and of course, then I have to have, yeah, 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 a Bible. It's always good to have a Bible when you're teaching. And, and that's great. And, and then I have a little zipper here and, and oh, yeah, yeah, toothpaste and <laughs> you need deodorant. Those are some pretty important items and oh let me see what's over here oh my journal I have to have my journal with me wherever I go and so that's that's kind of cool and of course I teach with my iPad I'd never want to go anywhere without that and and so I have my iPad and, and uh, of course I have little eyeglasses a pen of course I have my my cell phone right here and got to have that for all the calls I I get and and that's important. Let's see, what else is there? Oh, crackers. You gotta have something to eat. And, and of course, in some of the places I travel, you never know what you got to eat. And so, I, oh, you have to have spam. Spam's a cool thing. So, that's that. And surely there's more. There's got. Let me see what else I got here. Hmm. Got my hair caught. Okay, what else is there? Um, I have this even back pocket. That's pretty good. And let me see. Oh, you gotta have a suit coat. Suit coat's important. And, oh, shirt, t-shirts, and of course I have one of these t-shirts for first assembly, and that's important. And 
Well, you have to have a good shirt or two, you know. That's great to have. And, of course, you need a second pair of pants. you got to have that. And, and so those are all good. And, and there's some other stuff here. Let's, let's see, what else is in here? Oh, you got to have extra shoes. I mean, who would not want to have shoes for, for such a journey? So, I mean, I think, there's, I, I think there's other stuff in here, but, you know, we, we have so much in here that we actually lose sight of it after a while. And, of course, you have to have your Starbucks and your coffee and, and all that. And, well, there you have it, 42 pockets in this, all for the journey, to make the journey successful when I would travel. We're in a series right now called The Journey. Is looking at Joshua and the journey into the promised land. And they had to have some essential components in order to do this well. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you this coming week, come ready to receive the Word of God. And even today, as we look at the journey and what God is requiring for us to have as we journey. Hello, welcome, friends of First Assembly. It's great to have you with us today. Journeys are interesting to me. They're going from the known to the unknown. Things that we're familiar with around us all of a sudden going to what we don't know or don't understand. Journeys are interesting. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was one of the historically great presidents of America. He's an interesting person. At age 39, he contracted polio. 39 years of age. Nine years or eight years later, he became the governor of New York State. After that, he became the senator, and eventually, he became a president of America. In fact, he's the only president that was elected three different times to serve. He was a veteran of World War II, so he fought in the war. He led the, uh, America through the Great Depression that we went through at a, at a time. And, and he saw changes take place in Europe due to the bully of Hitler and taking over various countries that uh, Hitler was attacking. He also hated war, but he saw it coming. And he knew probably that America would be involved in it. And after taking the oath of office as president his first time, Roosevelt delivered what became a very famous speech. The speech wasn't long by any stretch. It was 20 minutes in length. It had 1,883 words. That was the entire length of the speech. But yet, one paragraph in that speech became very, very famous. Let me read that to you. You'll see it on the screen as well. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. What an incredible statement. It's almost a statement that would fit today, isn't it? FDR died before the end of World War II. He led America all the way through the majority of it, but yet it was his young vice president, Harry Truman, that became the American leader that would walk us across that finish line of World War II. It was him that would make some of the tough decisions that literally cost thousands of lives, but at the same time saved millions more. He would need to become the man once FDR stepped away. The desk would have that plaque on it that says, the buck stops here, the man. Our new series is called The Journey. All Christianity is a journey. It's where we're called to follow God with faith more than with our sight. But that's not easy, is it? That's not an easy task to follow God by faith. I don't know about you, but I like to know where my feet are going to land before I jump. But yet, this is the call of the Christian, to follow God by faith. 
My scripture this morning will start with Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2. Five simple words. But yet these five words set the precedent for this incredible journey Joshua and the children of Israel begin. Here's what it says. Moses, my servant, is dead. Moses, my servant, is dead. Moses was a great leader. He led Israel from slavery in Egypt, where they'd been under the, the bondage for years of the Egyptians, and led them from there to the cusp of the promised land, the edge of it. So close, but yet so far away. When I was a young boy, uh, my, my mom's family, all of them, lived in Southern California. We lived in Central Minnesota. There's a long ways between those two. And every few years, we'd load the family up in our Rambler or our Studebaker or whatever the car was at the moment, and we'd make the journey across America from Minnesota, the farmlands, to Central California. We load up the car and I have my three siblings are in the back seat and my dad's driving, usually always. My mom's sitting by the other door and I got the middle armrest where I sat on that little hump in the middle of the car and no seat belt, we didn't have them back then and looked out the window for hours and hours and hours as we traveled across the country. It's interesting to me because dad would show me on the map where we're going, no freeways just two-lane road all through these farm communities. And he showed me where we're going, how far we had gone. And I look with my little child eyes and see this much space knocked off the map. And yet we needed this much to go. I couldn't believe how long that journey was taking. You mean that's all the further we went. We're so close, but yet we're so very far away. Moses directed the children of Israel on a journey that would cover 750 miles. Now, this journey could have been a lot shorter had they been obedient to God from the get-go. But they didn't. Various things caused them to be disobedient, and, and one thing led to another, and as a result, they wandered 750 miles in this wilderness. Wow. What a long distance this would be. Here's a pause of pastor moment, really. It's a discussion point for maybe your kids. How would they like to travel 750 miles by foot, sleeping in tents? It would be hot in this part of the country, this part of the world. And how would they enjoy that? You know, we've been in quarantine for what? 30 days, maybe a little bit longer than that. And when I talk to people via Skype or Zoom or some other media device, they are sometimes fit to be tied to get outside, to get out and go to a restaurant or go visit with a neighbor, but yet they don't or they can't. This is just 30 some days we've been sort of quarantined. Israel's been locked in their quarantine of the wilderness for years covering 750 miles. So here's a question for your pause of pastor for those with you. How would you do in that type of scenario? What would your event be like? How do you think Israel responded to this time? How is their attitude? Think about that and talk about it just for a moment. Most of us, like to have our normal, normal. I don't know about you, but I like things to be comfortable, like I'm used to. My comfort zone, so it would be. My normal being normal. Now, we don't know what the new normal is gonna look like. Maybe it'll be the same, maybe it'll have a different twist. We don't know. But there, there will be a new normal. What was Israel's normal as they wandered through the uh, wilderness? I don't always know, but I'm sure they had their their uh, set standard of things they did. This is the second time when we get to this chapter that Israel has come to 
the line where they're ready to enter into the promised land. The second time. The first time, Moses, by direction of God, sent out spies. Twelve of them in all, one from each tribe. And so we want you to go into this area, the promised land. I want you to look around, see what you see, and bring back your report to us and so we know what we're looking at. We go to Numbers chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of his leaders. Now they covered three basic areas on their journey. Each area that Israel would cover were unique or stood out. And of course, you start off in Goshen, Egypt, where Joseph originally settled. They went from there to Mount Sinai. From Mount Sinai, they went on to Kadesh Barnea. And from Kadesh Barnea, they ultimately went on to the border of Jericho. Now, I have a statement I want to make, and, and I'm really curious if you think it's a true statement or a not true statement. For me, I think it's true, and I'll explain why. And you can even pause me for a moment as you discuss this statement and give reasons why you think it is true or not true. But here's the statement. Christianity is messy. Christianity is messy. Can you think of examples, yes or no, to that statement? When the spies returned from Jericho or from that region, two of them had a really good report, Joshua and Caleb. These men, they were excited. This land is cool. Now, I don't know if they used the word cool. Maybe not. But they probably said something similar to that in Arabic. I don't know. But this is great. And here's what they said. Let's go. It's the land God has blessed and given to us to conquer. Man, what a great spirit these two guys had. But the rest of them, the ten, they didn't have quite that same spirit. They had a little bit of negativity, doubting in themselves. Numbers chapter 13, verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Param. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. I am sure they were thrilled the fruit and the grapes and and uh, the melons and, and the uh, grapefruit, maybe. I don't know. I like grapefruit. Maybe they had that too. I don't know. But they showed all the product of this land, and it must have been pretty impressive. Verse 28. But the people who live there, uh-oh, they're powerful. And the cities, they're fortified. And they're very large. Verse 31, 32. But the men who had gone up with him said, We cannot, we cannot, we cannot attack those people. Why? Because they are stronger than we are. How do they know that? How do they know that? And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They were telling bad Reports, oh, it's terrible. We can't do it. They said the land we explore devours, devours those living in it. And the people saw the size, the people there. And they are great size. These ten men with a negative report would say, we can't do it. No way, no how. The people are too strong. And in our eyes, we are like grasshoppers to them. We are bugs on the windscreen. The people rejected the chance to enter the promised land at that time because of fear and doubt. As a result, they wandered around for 40 years. And every one of those fearful people except for Joshua and Caleb, who would perish in the wilderness. 
Every time a new funeral took place, it was a reminder that those people chose fear over faith. So I come back to this statement. Christianity is messy. Here's the truth. I believe it is messy because it deals with us. People have a lot of baggage. We all carry it. We carry baggage of our childhood even. Years ago, sometimes it's really hard to set that baggage down. And that's what makes Christianity so important as well. Because Jesus works with messy people. I like that. Jesus has a plan for our mess. And if we allow him, he will take the mess from us and turn it into a blessing. Jesus works with messy people. I know in church, and I talk about church broad, around the world. There are good people and there are bad people. I hope, I hope, our church is open to everybody. That we're not selective of who comes in our doors. Whether it be the worst person or the best person, I want a church that simply says, whosoever will let them come. Because Jesus loves all people. Hate sin, love sinners. So that's what I'm, I'm hoping. But let me ask you a question. If you had a $20 bill, or I had a $20 bill that was counterfeit, and I go to the store to buy something at Walmart, and I pull out my $20 bill that's a counterfeit, and it's discovered that that's a counterfeited $20 bill, and they compensate it, or comp they take it from me, and I lose it. I lose that $20 bill because it was bad. For the rest of my life, do you think every time I get a new $20 bill, I'm going to throw it away because I'm afraid it's a counterfeit? Oh, I don't want a $20 bill. Throw that thing away. No. Just because one was bad doesn't mean they're all bad. Sometimes Christianity is the same way. We judge Christianity based on one or two. But the fact is, Christianity, at times, is messy because it deals with people that bring baggage. But Jesus is in the business of helping those with baggage. He takes our mess and works it into his blessing. Let's go back to our journey. For 40 years, the people of Israel have wandered through the wilderness and they're following the guidance or the leadership of Moses. He's leading them faithfully all through this process. Even though at times, these, these guys, these gals, they're mumbling under their breath. Have you ever done that? You mumbled by someone or because of someone under your breath, so just they don't hear you, but you're kind of grumbling about it, maybe a boss, maybe a parent. But they still followed Moses. Every day, they followed Moses, this great leader of Israel. And through his leadership, they had food, they drank fresh water, guidance and decisions were made. And to Israel, Moses was the leader. He was their leader. In a modern terminology, you'd say he was the man. He was the man. Now men, we like this term, the man. I'm the man. We're the man. We like that term. It sounds so cool from a guy's perspective. Now maybe for the gals sitting listening to me, with a shrug of the shoulders you say, what's the difference? Who cares? What's the man? But ladies, do you know what the term means to a guy? Let me explain it to you. Let me tell you exactly what it means. The term, the man, it means like, the man. Yeah? Now, all the guys would just give one of these great Grunts, yeah, mm -hmm. the man. Tim Allen was in a show called Home Improvement. I always liked it. But uh, he was one of these guys that did the classic grunt whenever he did something or wanted something or didn't agree with something. Mm -hmm. It was always his grunt. And, and uh, guys are good with grunts. You know, guy, you can, guys, you can take a moment right now and just give a big, mm -hmm. your grunt, the man. Moses was a great leader. Of Israel. He brought the people out of bondage, out of Egypt, under the hand of oppression and into freedom. But now that great leader 
Moses is dead. A new man is taking that place, and that's Joshua. He is now the man. He's the one tasked by God to continue the journey and bring that journey to completion. Joshua chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. This opens up with such a strong sentence. Moses, my servant, is dead. That's it. All she wrote. End of story. Next chapter. Time to move on. It's both exciting and terrifying for Joshua. He's now the boss. What does he do now? Where does he go from here? Here's a fact. God never puts you in a position that you can't handle. Now, if you try it on your own, yes, you may fail. But if God calls me, if God places me, God ordains me, and God will sustain me. For 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. The message, a loose-knit translation of the scripture, puts that phrase like this. My grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. That was Paul writing. That's where Joshua finds himself now. He needs the grace of God. He is the man. He's been given authority and the promise, both of them. Just having authority, I don't think is enough. It's one thing to be given authority, but it's a whole different thing to use it correctly. As a parent, or for you as a parent, we have authority over our kids to raise them the best we see possible. But that authority does not mean I'm going to be successful in raising my children. There's more than raising kids than just having authority, isn't there? I need things like wisdom, courage, understanding, compassion, vision, faith, even boldness. That's just a few of the things I need to be successful in navigating raising my kids. Just having authority isn't sufficient. Jo uh, Joshua is given authority. But that doesn't mean he's going to be successful. There's more to it than just his authority. There's a requirement called action. He needs to follow after God. His faith was involved in the process of following God. To do what God told him to do took faith. To cross the Jordan took faith. It's where we discover our spiritual success when we are obedient to God. And that's where Joshua had to discover his success. Not just in the authority, but in the faith of following after God. We see our faith grow when we follow the commands of God. To obey God and follow after Him is when I see His blessing begin to unfold on my life and those who follow me. If I have a takeaway from today, here's what it would be. I want to hear from God through His Word, what we're doing right now, like in this message. But I want to respond to God. I want to follow after Him. I want to do what He asks me to do. This is the promise of God. We follow, we're obedient to Him, and He will be faithful to us. Let me close with the words of God following the call of Joshua to be obedient. Verse 5 and 6. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Wow, that's pretty cool. As I was with Moses, this great leader, the man, Moses, 
so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead. You will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their, to their ancestors to give them. There's no any question there. There's no question. This is what's going to happen if you're obedient. So this is my prayer for you today. Strength to stand. Courage to move forward. Understanding that God is with you. And to inherit the promise of God. How does that happen? When I obey the word of God, God honors my faith. Verse 8 and 9. Here's the requirement for Joshua in obeying God. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. I like both of those words. Prosperous and successful. Have not I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. We need this today, don't we? We need this today. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Let me speak to you really honestly before God right now. As you've been home or limited in your outings, some of you have been fearful, concerned. Let me tell you this. If you are following after God, if God is Lord of your life, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's the promise of the Lord. That's what God told Joshua when he is filling some very big shoes in the man Moses. Here's my prayer that I want to pray for you today. I want to pray that God would help you see this verse, help you see this promise of his to you. If you need Christ today, and you find your life is that mess that I spoke about, He's here to take the mess and create His blessing. You can pray for God's salvation, and He will save you. But pray with me. Let's pray that God will bless this journey of faith that we're on. Jesus, help us right now. Be men and women of faith. As we enter a journey, we walk in this journey of our Christian life. We walk by faith, not by sight. We trust in you. In fact, Lord, I really want you to drive the vehicle and I be the passenger. That you direct my steps in everything I do. Father, I pray for any today that are listening to me and their life looks like this mess. God, I pray they would release that to you. They would say, Jesus, forgive my sin. Be Lord of my life. Take my mess and turn it into your blessing. God, you are the God of messy things. You take our sin and you give us forgiveness. Lord, be with us, I pray. May this be a great week of following after you. Amen. If you made a prayer salvation this week, please send me a note. Tell me. Let me rejoice with you. If you have a question or prayer need, let me pray with you. God bless you. Every week, every, every day, I cut that part out. There we go. God bless you. We're done.
Hey church family, we're glad that you were able to join us today and we hope that this message was able to bless you today. We would love to pray for you. So if you are needing any prayer requests or even know somebody else who does, go ahead and email our church email or you can email Pastor Terrence specifically. But we have a team of people that would love to just be here for you and encourage you and pray with you through your hard times. Also, if you would like to give, you can follow this link right here, or you can text AOG1 to the number 555-888. But we hope you have a blessed rest of your day today, and we love you guys. We will see you next Sunday, 1030 in the morning at First at Home.